This week, in the parish of bourses and market structure, it's been a disappointing week for India with poor NSE results and a first failure for interoperability. Meanwhile, the clamour for ASX monopoly reform continues. But will the government spring into action or will we retain business as usual, ASIC in action? And we witness accounting shocks at CBOE and ICE. My name is Patrick L. Young. Welcome to the Bourse Business Weekly Digest. It's the Exchange Invest Weekly Podcast, Episode 84. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. This is a very brief reduction of highlights amongst the key headlines from the week in market structure. All the analysis of the week's many events and happenings can be found in Exchange Invest's daily subscriber newsletter, the unique guide to the bourse business sent daily to your inbox. More details at exchangeinvest.com. The Hong Kong Financial Secretary Paul Chan Mo Po has defended his move to raise Hong Kong Exchange's stamp duty from 0.1% to 13 basis points this week amid a record deficit, noting innovation, not low costs, will energize the Hong Kong stock market. In good news for Russia, the investor crowd has grown again. The number of private investors at Moscow Exchange reached 10 million by the end of February, having grown from 8.8 million at the start of the year, an increase of 1.2 million people already in 2021. MOEX, you will recall, leapt from barely 3.5 million users to 8.8 million during 2020. In the past 12 months, that marks a near 7 million investor increase in one year. Sadly, over in Chicago, SIBO has exposed itself to ridicule this week. As it turns out, it charged most traders the wrong sum for years. Some were overcharged, some got away with paying less than expected. But now, SIBO just wants to keep the whole sorry affair and sweep it under the carpet and move on. This is, frankly, goo-boo territory. Grotesque, unbelievable, bizarre and unprecedented for any business. However, for a regulated provider of financial market structure, this is an absolute disgrace. Then again, given the free ride the CFTC gave the CME over the Cushing crisis, can we expect the SEC to intervene? Down under, the central bank is frustrated at recent ASX trading failures, as an article in the Australian Financial Review notes. Reserve Bank of Australia puts heat on ASX over trading monopoly failures, runs the headline. And I quote, One theory that regulators may explore is if there is a protection racket in financial markets buttressing the ASX monopoly. Are shareholders looking the other way and pocketing their high returns? Reform is urgently overdue around Oz Inc.'s vastly outmoded corporate cosy corner club of monopolies. As noted before, it's ironic that while engaged with a diplomatic spat with China over freedom and openness, the Communist Party-controlled megastate is in fact more open to exchange and other capitalist competition in the private sector than the supposedly free, liberal Australia. Meanwhile, That self-described technology company, ASX, offers no guarantees it can actually coherently achieve its self-proclaimed core competence. This nonsense makes the nation, let alone the Sydney Financial Centre, look sadly ridiculous. Meanwhile, the UK budget marked another disappointing big state affair for the nominally pro-free market government. At least there was good news about the state of Lord Hill's listing review, with reforms proposed to further advance London's competitive stock listing venues. Aqua CEO Alistair Haynes made a splendid comment disintermediating the need for PLY to add anything more. It is excellent to see recognition of the importance of retail participation in IPOs. 
and the understanding that much of what restricts this today is down to unwieldy prospectus requirements. We, that is Aquas, are therefore keen to see the proposals for prospectus reform implemented with as much urgency as possible to benefit the end investor. Over in results, it was another busy week for results in the parish. All the deals were in Exchange Invest Daily, the newsletter no person can afford to be without in capital markets and market structure. For the sake of this podcast, let's look at some edited highlights. This week, we saw great news on results all the way from Johannesburg in sunny South Africa to Bucharest in Romania. But alas, there was a big disappointment at the National Stock Exchange of India. They saw a big profit decline of 57% in the final quarter of the 2020 calendar year. Likewise in deals, another busy week in the parish there. And once again, all the deals were in Exchange Invest Daily, the newsletter no person could afford to be without in capital markets and market structure. One warning shot was fired across the bows of S&P Global, as IHS market investors are seeking to check the maths on the $44 billion merger, about which many expressed some surprise at the price S&P are paying. Elsewhere, Deutsche Börse. They have successfully completed the acquisition of an 81% stake in ISS, the governance, ESG data, and analytics provider, which now leaves DB1 in a direct conflict of interest across its listing business and indeed with other listed exchanges where ISS provides services to shareholders. I believe this is untenable. Good news at the same time for Euronext as EU competition authorities have approved their bargain 4.3 billion euro acquisition of Borsa Italiana, a gift, as you will recall, from the London Stock Exchange Group's hasty purchase of Refinitiv. In new markets over in Gujarat, are they looking a gift horse in the mouth? India's NSE, INX, NDSL and CDSL have teamed up to create market infrastructure in the Gift Financial Centre. Is this exchange cooperation, per se, or a case of risk mitigation by Indian bourses? Unconvinced the Gift Financial Centre is a truly viable idea, but are keen to be seen to be doing something to support the government's initiative in its home territory. Now don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, check into our live stream, ipo vid You can find us via YouTube and also streaming live on Facebook and LinkedIn. That happens every Tuesday at 6pm. Coming next week, we have Daniel Hodson, the chairman of the City United Project, the organisation that's moving forward the post-Brexit future and unity of the City of London. This week, we had a fantastic conversation between Digital Asset, Expiry and Bay Markets, represented respectively by Peter Fredrickson, Magnus Almqvist and Eric Saranetsky. You can catch the whole of that recorded on YouTube, IPO-vid, search on YouTube.com. Crypto news this week, Coinbase announced a wildly exciting IPO with a valuation that could top $100 billion at relatively conservative values. If expanded to the most extreme levels of the legacy parish, it could make Coinbase one of the most valuable companies on earth. Coinbase in 2020 pulled in total revenue of $1.3 billion. That's up from $533.7 million in 2019. Coinbase reported net income of $322.3 million last year, swinging from a loss of $30.4 million the previous year. The fatal flaw of Coinbase remains, of course, the high cost of trading in crypto assets. Bring the fees down to something akin to the legacy markets and income collapses. At the same time, in this psycho-hype market of cryptocurrency, valuations are suggesting anything from umpteen to $100 billion, in which case the largest parish property at the top of the pyramid would be Coinbase. That doesn't strike me as highly sensible, at least in the long term, as I am not full of bounteous enthusiasm, because I think all the V1 version 1 legacy crypto exchanges are just not able to handle the transition to the sorts of fee structures that are common amongst their much, much cheaper legacy cousins. Product news this week, 
It's a sad moment in Chinese listings. The New York Stock Exchange has commenced delisting proceedings against CNOOC, the China National Overseas Oil Corporation, to comply with Donald Trump's Executive Order 13959. Then again, China's refusal to countenance US auditing reports for overseas listings is frustrating. As we can see, the Biden administration, as expected, is similarly talking tough on Chinese policy as Trump continues to shape US foreign policy ex officio. Of course, there was an interesting contrast to that. The Voice of America reported this week Chinese company IPOs on US exchanges hit a 10-year high in 2020. Who'd have thunk that, ladies and gentlemen, that while President Trump was trying to ban some listed Chinese companies in the US, Actually, the IPO business for Chinese corps in USA during 2020 was, how else can one say it but in the language of the Donald himself, huge. In other IPO news, Ant Group are telling staff that they hope to resume their IPO process in the near future as Beijing is finalizing new rules for the digital lender. Who knows where that valuation may lie when it eventually comes to market for a second attempt at an IPO, albeit I'm not sure it will still be in world record territory. Interesting to see that Clara First is making a return to the edges of the parish as the UK Chancellor of the Exchequer announced during a rather interventionist big government budget speech this week that Dame Clara, the former London Stock Exchange Group CEO, will lead a new policy group seeking to establish London as a global carbon offset market hub. Technology news this week was dominated by the National Stock Exchange of India's mega glitch and the fallout in the aftermath thereof. Even the finance minister, Nirmala Sitharaman, intervened this week to say that the recent technical glitch at the National Stock Exchange, which led to trading being suspended, has cost India, both in fiscal and reputational terms. This is, of course, quite correct. Could the treasurer of the Australian Commonwealth please take note? And indeed, back to India. The cost of the NSEL debacle is even greater still. Regulation news this week. Gary Gensler went to the Hill and was expounding in confirmation hearings how he expects to run the SEC this week. The standard leftist tropes loomed large amongst the confirmation hearings of all the protagonists looking at regulatory positions. Protecting investors was writ large, where the reality is the analog regulatory blob is still stuck in a Dickensian age in the USA and elsewhere, including, it seems unfortunately, Gary Gensler, who likes to suggest he has digital skills after a university flirtation with Bitcoin during the Trump years. However, I am rather unconvinced. There needs to be new thinking and regulation, but none of the regulators appear up to the job right now in the United States or the European Union. Elsewhere, ESMA are proposing improvements to Transparency Directive after the Wirecard case. Well, the call for tougher rules is surely an erroneous assertion. The idea that everything can be solved by needing more regulation is typical of the EU mindset. Rather, what we need is competent, open-minded regulators, not driven, as Baffin in Germany were, by a blinkered protectionism of anything German. That would have seen the Wirecard scandal being discovered much, much earlier. In careers news this week, well, shock at the top of the Intercontinental Exchange. Their CFO, Scott Hill is retiring after 14 incredible years of service, having joined the just public Intercontinental Exchange and turned it into the global powerhouse that it is today at the top of Young's Pyramid. This is a shock in many ways, as Scott Hill's effortless mastery of the ICE finances has been a cornerstone of the business's vaulting success from small cap to top tier player in Young's Pyramid in just over a decade. I can only applaud Scott Hill's enormous success at ICE and wish him all the best for the future. Meanwhile, huge congratulations to Investor Relations Supremo Warren Gardner, who is moving up to fill Scott's shoes from May the 15th, while Scott himself will remain an advisor to the Intercontinental Exchanges until February 2023. 
Thanks for listening to Exchange Invest Weekly. We welcome your feedback. You can contact me directly, patrick at derivativesvision.com with any comments. Meanwhile, if you enjoyed this show, we would welcome you giving us a thumbs up. Or if you have time, a positive review will always be welcome wherever you find this podcast. The new CEO of the Hong Kong Exchanges Group, Nicholas Agazin, he has been approved by the Hong Kong regulator from May the 24th for a three-year term as expected. Elsewhere, over in the UK, Paul Fincham will join the London Stock Exchange Group as Head of Communications. The London Stock Exchange Group's communications mess hopefully hit its all-time nadir when it transpired that the last geezer in charge of messaging had in fact been a woman all along. Not that we actually knew. Let's optimistically say good luck to Paul Fincham while realistically acknowledging that we don't expect to hear from him in keeping with the, well, whatever it is, of London Stock Exchange Group PR to engage with anybody who doesn't toe the line with their historic misunderstanding that agate prop and PR are not as interchangeable as they were on, say, Russian railway lines during the 1920s. Meanwhile, for anybody on the refinitive side of the LSEG monolith, remember, apparently there's been a revolution in Russia. Just a heads up, lest it might help. Finally this week, a valet to Alvin Donahue. He lived to be 102, a ripe old age. He was a D-Day veteran and former Minneapolis Grain Exchange VP. Valet to a great American hero. Finally this week, well, let's just look at Big World. The former president of the French Republic, famed for its liberté, égalité, fraternité, revolutionary call to arms, has been sentenced to jail for corruption, including judge bribing. But he won't spend a day in jail because two years of the sentence are suspended, leaving Nicolas Sarkozy with a year of house arrest with Carla Bruni. Or, as the rest of us know it, he's been sentenced to lockdown, albeit we suffer without Carla Bruni. And on that mysterious and magnificent note, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Patrick L. Young. Thank you very much for joining me for this episode 84 of the Exchange Invest Weekly Podcast. We'll be back next week. In the meantime, have a great week in markets. This show relates to the business of bourses. It is not to be construed as investment advice, nor are we making any investment recommendations. Please consult an investment advisor before you make any investments, and for goodness sake, do your due diligence and do not make investments without complying with the regulations in your home state. Exchange Invest cannot be held responsible for any investment decisions made as a result of our programme, which is for entertainment purposes only. The material herein is copyright Patrick L. Young at the date of publication, while our music and sound effects are sourced from copyright-free sources. Thanks for listening to Exchange Invest Weekly, the exchange of information.